Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, in this episode, Joseph and I tackled the topic of divorce. We talked about the heartbreak of divorce, uh, the different ways that you can experience it if you're the person initiating the divorce versus being the person upon whom maybe this was sprung out of the blue. We also talked about some of the potentials in, in divorce, the way that it can often feel like a relief. It can open us up to new psychospiritual growth. growth. It can uh, call for us to be initiated into adulthood. So I think we did our usual job of circumambulating it. And I do want to acknowledge, we, we talked about um, the work of Leanne Downs, who is a Jungian analyst who wrote her thesis on divorce, and I was lucky enough to be able to read it. And her website is leannedownsjungian.com. We'll put that in the show notes. But uh, she's interested in hearing from you if you have a divorce story, because she might be doing more writing on this in the future. So I hope that you enjoy today's episode. Divorce by Jose Alcantara He has flown headfirst against the glass and now lies stunned on the stone patio, nothing moving but his quick beating heart. So you go to him, pick up his delicate body and hold him in cupped palms of your hands. You've always known he was beautiful, but it's only now in his stillness, in his vulnerability, that you see the miracle of his being, how so much life fits in so small a space. And so you wait, keeping him warm against the unseasonable cold, trusting that when the time is right, when he has recovered both his strength and his sense of up and down, he will gather himself, flutter once or twice, and then rise, a streak of dazzling color against a slowly lifting sky. What a powerful arc Mm -hmm. in that poem about divorce, and how it is for so many of us. It is like flying into... Uh, a, a window that we, we yep. didn't see. And yeah, we're, yes. We're knocked, stunned. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we lose our sense of up and down. Exactly. Yeah, it's a beautiful poem because it doesn't mention divorce at all in the poem, and yet it, it describes the experience so poignantly, how disorienting and it can be. It does. And it evokes the attitude of the self, because even as we are the bird that has smashed into this unexpected situation, so there is a larger one inside of us, a larger attitude that is also holding us and observing and warming us and holds a certainty about our potential to Mm -hmm. recover and soar again that the ego in the moment of distress, often cannot find. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of how birds are often associated with hope, um, or at least they were for Emily Dickinson, and, mm-hmm. and how, you know, a loss of hope can be an aspect of going through a divorce. So, divorce comes from the Latin word, divertere, which means to turn in a different direction. And and divorce and to divert, they all have that same root. 
So, in that regard, there is something simple about divorce on that very archetypal level of having traveled as two people in a particular direction mm -hmm. and one or both turning into a new direction. Mm -hmm. There's something comforting in the simplicity of that idea, especially in the midst of all of the incredible flood of details mm -hmm. that any of us has to deal with when we are ending a marriage. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the different, I want to say kind of um, shades or, f or of, of emotion that we might have about a divorce. And it obviously depends on where we are in it and how it came about. I'm, I'm thinking of, like you're saying, the, the incredible overwhelm about the, the, the details, you know, I have, I have actually right now several friends going through awful divorces and, and just the amount of kind of back and forth with the lawyers and the forensic accountants and the money and the kids and the visitation and the constant legal wrangling. Uh, and and just uh, I'm I'm watching in some uh, awe actually as my friends uh, navigate this because just the amount of the administrative burden of oh I don't know figuring out how you're going to liquidate the assets and and get the house ready to put on the market you know in the midst of the the emotional upset um so i think there there can be just this incredible kind of numbness and overwhelm there can be tremendous um sadness uh, despair fury anger if we're the one who's been left and for some people divorce brings a sense of relief A lot's on the table all of a sudden, just as it is <laughs> with the divorce. Yes, I like my, yes. I like my overly simplistic idea, <laughs> just turning in different directions. <laughs> well, and, as but, it is, <laughs> you know, but but Joseph, I, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. I you know recently was talking to someone who was considering a divorce, and and she felt very, very, very <laughs> overwhelmed by it. And I, I was able to say, because I've seen a lot of people do this, it's going to be really awful for about a year. And then it, and you will, there is another, there is another side, you know, there's this side of it when you've got to tell the person, uh, or, or tell the kids and you've got to find the lawyer and you've got to do the money and you've got to sell the house and you, and, but once you're past that, there is another life. So, so in some sense, what you're evoking with your, just turn a different direction. And obviously for some of us, if we don't have a lot of assets and there aren't kids or there's a good prenup, it can just kind of be like, oh, let's sign on the dotted line and walk away. But for most people, you know, the nature of a marriage is that your life gets entwined and you have to exactly. disentangle all of these things. So people talk about the dissolution of a marriage mm -hmm. and that alchemical metaphor is so apt that we come together in this crucible as two different substances, and Jung writes about this, and there's a chemical reaction of some intensity, and then we become an amalgam. And from the amalgam of the marriage, all of these secondary effects occur, some of which are wonderful, and for some of us can become toxic. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. some marriages give off fumes that make us or other people around us perhaps unwell. And we may try to fight that and try to go through another alchemical process. Well, let's try to transform it over yes. and over again, which of course mm -hmm. is a worthy pursuit mm -hmm. because the joining together is so profound and the separating is so costly. Yes. That it's, it's worthy of attempting at least to improve the amalgam if that mm -hmm. is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're leaning into this really important question that we have discussed at other times on the podcast, but I'm I'm also very interested in this question is like, when is a divorce the right thing? Because I mean, it certainly is sometimes. Um, but you know, there's interesting, uh, there's interesting data too on how people feel after a divorce. Some people 
you know, we're like, not what did I really need to do that? There is sometimes some of that flavor among a certain percentage of people. I mean, look, I think in in some sense that people who who fall into the category of this marriage clearly needs to end are fortunate. Like, like the person mm-hmm. is using drugs or the person is, you know, cheating on me or the person is, you know, violent or the person is, you know, fill in the blank, the kind of thing that you tell anyone and they'd be like, oh God, you know, get out as fast as you can. But for many of us, that's not the case. And we don't have that clarity. And of course, this is a reason why many people come into therapy, at least for me, for you know, my entire time in practice. This has been a, a major issue that has that has brought people to my consulting room, which is I think I might need to leave my marriage and uh, or my long-term relationship, or whatever. And and um, you know, having sort of sat with people in that discernment process. You know, many decide to leave, but but a certain number don't. And uh, and it, it is interesting to think about how do you know? How do you know if it's right to leave? Um, what what sh- what criteria should you use? Um, you know, some people kind of get into affairs, and it seems to me that that's often a way of um, letting, letting some unconscious part of us decide that the relationship is over before we can consciously admit that to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's pick any, any one of those starting places (laughs) and kind of work through it. So first, just, um, I just want to reflect on the, just marriage itself. Mm-hmm. You know, just just to get a, a basic sense of it, that so much about the archetype of marriage has to do with the sense of completeness that we move through life, longing, feeling that there is more in us, there is more possible, and that when we come into relationship with another person who seems to evoke the sense of wholeness, that is rare and incredibly exciting. Yeah. And the wholeness can come forward in a number of ways that a marvelous sexual connection is a kind of wholeness mm-hmm. to, to meet somebody in that erotic dance in such a way that it feels so fulfilling, so remarkably gratifying is important. To meet somebody who fits so beautifully with us that we experience a sense of peace, Mm -hmm. that that the rumblings inside of us, the fight, the longing, the searching, comes to a a blissful pause in the arms of the beloved. And then there is another kind of union, which is a union of joy, that when we are with the beloved, there is such a sense of mounting dynamism in one idea. And we talked for 10 hours on that first date and Mm -hmm. one idea leads to another idea. And then we found ourselves just in a state of delight. So there's all these levels of, of union or the promise of union. And if we come to a, a feeling that there is a high likelihood that we will maintain these states of union. And by comparison to other relationships, this is extraordinary. We may come to the decision to want to commit to a permanency that we shall both be together for this life in these states of union. And even though we might read all kinds of books and YouTube videos that say, well, you know, it's all going to change over time. We go in with a nod to that, but really our current experience gives us a sense that the relationship is so valuable. And I think this is where I'm going to go as we move towards the divorce stage, that the marriage and the other person has such a high value that we want to enter into a contractual agreement Mm -hmm. that we are going to nurture this value and we're going to protect the value of the relationship against the assaults that life is likely to give us. 
And so the transition out of that state, to me, has something to do with what I was going to say is uh, the violence to any of those unions, mm-hmm. that the sexual joy um, begins to fall apart, or the sense of peace and completeness begins to disrupt, or the sense of dynamic joy begins to somehow go awry. And so I'm going to just lean into typology. And I'm, I'm trying to look for some kind of central tenets because there are 10,000 tiny mm-hmm. pieces to divorce, all of which are valid, but there's so many moving parts. So in terms of Jung's typological system, we are going to fall into one of two positions. We're either feeling types or thinking types. And the reason that's important is that we evaluate or we determine the value of a thing, of an object, based on either what we think about it or how we feel about it. So feeling types, in a very basic way, and I'm a feeling type, if I like something, I want to move towards it. Mm-hmm. If I'm neutral about it, I may or may not be terribly motivated. And if I'm averse to it, if I really dislike something, it can be very, very difficult for me to value it. We're born this way. I don't think we have a choice. We can force ourselves to stay in relationship to all kinds of people, things, and situations as an act of will. But in terms of whether or not we value something, whatever contributes to us liking it more means that it's more valuable. As thinking types, we would actually have a growing list of positive thoughts and evaluations that are quite rational, that all these potentials are rationally there, all of these Um, realities are rationally present and in the relationship and with this person it's very perceivable to me as a thinking type and so consequently the relationship and the other person becomes more and more valuable and one would say that at some point either on a feeling level or a thinking level the other person becomes the most valuable and more valuable than other people we might commit to And if that value sustains, we come to believe the relationship, the person, our visions are valuable enough to commit a life to. So part of the movement towards divorce is the accretion of experiences that cause the marriage and the other person to lose value in our inner world. So, as a feeling type, if I am in relationship with anyone, could be a friend, could be a lover, if I am in that relationship and the behavior of the other person, the context, or the synergy, for that matter, between us, creates intensely painful emotionally painful experiences and they are poignant and they continue month after month, year after year after year. As a feeling type, it can be very, very difficult for me to hold that relationship and that person with the high level of regard that I had at one time. And at a certain point, the relationship can lose value and become something that, as a feeling type, I want to retreat from or might powerfully need to retreat from. So these assaults to the heart Mm -hmm. of the feeling type is one thing that can lead to the decision of dissolution. Now, I'm not a thinking type, so sometimes I'll speak to this more clumsily. But again, We're in the relationship, the other person, we have a a huge library of very positive reasons that this person is valuable and the relationship is. 
And in a quite rational way, I could observe changes of circumstances that alter the reasons to be with this person and the reasons to be in this marriage. And at some point, there are so many reasons to step away that, again, the thinking person has a very hard time holding the relationship as valuable. And then other fantasies of dissolution begin to rise up. You know, uh, leaning into what you're saying a little bit, I think, is I remember in social work school reading about divorce, and the professor said something I have never forgotten, that when we get engaged or we get married, we have the wonderful feeling of being chosen. Mm -hmm. And getting divorced is like being unchosen. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really poignant, you know, because we, we do have a primal need for connection and partnership. I mean, most of us um, yearn for partnership. <laughs> And so to find that in a marriage, you know, I mean, this is why, you know, weddings and engagements are just such happy times. And, mm -hmm. and then to have that fall apart is so, is so devastating. I mean, the, you know, as I said before, I think there can be a real range in what we feel around divorce, including like, hooray, you know, um, yeah. but, but at a minimum, I think there's a terrible sadness at the end of the fantasy of um, completeness and connection, that we have found our person yeah. and that this will be our person forever. And I mean, I don't think anyone, you know, most people, let's say, don't begin a marriage thinking, ah, maybe we'll get divorced in a few years, you know. You, you, the purpose of marriage is to make a vow that it's, you know, through good times and through bad till death do us part. So when it's not that, it, there, there is the, the loss, even if we're happy to let the person go, um, it's, there's often a tremendous sadness about having to let go that fantasy that we've, that we've found a forever something. And, and that is, it's just so very true. I think of, um, there's sadness, sadness and grief are somewhat different to me. I, in fact, I've recently been was talking with one of my analysts about how those things, how those things are different, and both are relevant in the divorce process. I think of grief, the pain of grief, is the sensation of accommodating to a new reality. And that every time how we thought something was going to be changes and it, in a way that's out of our control, there is a kind of pain that we go through. And the end of grief is often the integration of the new reality, that this new thing is true. Somebody passes away. There is this process of accommodating the new reality that they are no longer here my spouse is now living somewhere else with someone else. And once we come to a state of acceptance, there often is a, a feeling that the grief is, is completed. Sadness is a, is a different kind of pain that I think has... Help me with this, um, Lise. How, how do we define sadness? Um, particularly as somewhat distinct from grief. Well, I mean, I definitely think they're related. I think that um, grief, I think of as a process, mm -hmm. something that you have to, uh, it's the process of um, kind of removing energy from something. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think of that wonderful psychoanalytic word, decathecting. That's essentially mm -hmm. what grief and mourning is, is, yeah. um, is kind of taking back the psychic energy that you had invested in someone or something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, s sadness m might be a part of grief, but it, it doesn't have that same function necessarily that grief has. I just want to take a minute out from the episode today to let you all know that we're going to be doing something really exciting 
on February 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern, we are going to be recording a podcast episode live on Zoom, and we would like for you to join us. You can reserve your spot. It's free, but you, you need to reserve your spot. You can do so at our website, thisjungianlife.com. We're going to be talking about my new book, The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire, which publishes on February 6th. And at the live podcast, we'll be taking questions. We'll have an opportunity for you to submit your dream at the podcast, and we'll select one of those dreams to discuss. And we'll also be entering everyone who comes into uh, a drawing to win one of five signed copies of my book. So I hope you'll join us. Uh, kinda come on over and get your free ticket, and uh, we'll see you there. Sad, I think, is that um, has something to do with that deflating, that um, it is the withdrawal of exaltation. It is the sense of, it comes in some ways uh, in, um, with a sense of defeat in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, s s sorrow too, I mean, it's a kind of, it's a core emotion. So it's, it's a little mm -hmm. hard to kind of break it down. It's, it has a, a a huge bodily component that we usually experience as tearfulness, whether it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's sobbing or that tightness in the throat or a kind of queasy feeling in our stomach, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. and it's, it just, it just kind of is when we're sorrowing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that sorrowing, I, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and is so important. The, the sorrowing. It's mm -hmm. almost like a season, mm -hmm. the sorrowing season. Yeah, it's it's something that we have to go through, whether or not what we're sorrowing over is the loss of the person, or or just as I said before, the kind of the loss of the idea of the relationship. But I want to say, you know, a lot of times um, divorce is really difficult because there's a lot of ambivalence. Right. I mean, again, mm -hmm. if your spouse uh, was cheating on you and had a drug habit, you might escape from the painful experience of ambivalence because perhaps you feel like this is 100 percent right. I need to do this. I'm not going to look back. And I've worked with people who've had that experience where they, um, you know, learned that their spouse, you know, uh, was um had returned to drug use, for example, and and they just saw very clearly that this is what had to happen, and and it can it can be less um, painful, I think, when you have that kind of clarity. But a lot of times we lack that, so we we feel unsure: is this really the right thing to do? And then oftentimes in modern legal divorces, the process almost kind of helps us out because people can be so fully awful to each other in this process that then you begin to hate the person and mm. you forget any good thing that you ever knew about the person, which is a shame in a lot of ways, especially if there are kids, you know, to kind of collapse that tension of opposites, to see the person as all bad and I do believe that the the again the legal process almost encourages that because you kind of have mm -hmm. to rewrite the narrative a little bit about just how awful the person is. And I'm, sh you know, in many cases the person is really awful, but it it might be that um, the legal process encourages us to really see it as black and white. Um, and and so then there's this kind of collapsing of the tension, and we're split off into hatred. And we try not to let that show to the kids because we want the kids to have an okay relationship with the other parent, hopefully. But but still, it's just any good that was there, talk about that process of kind of leeching it of value. We can't look back and think, oh, God, I know why I married him or I know why I married her. You know, that was really great in the beginning. It's like it's gone. And, you know, hatred is a powerful, it's a powerful place to sit. You know, it, it, it can be a kind of compensatory inflation to the feelings of um, smallness and sadness. And it can, uh, it can give us that kind of needed clarity. It's a very difficult thing to do to navigate a divorce with a person where you can say to the other person, you know, we gave it a good try. 
uh, but it's really not working and I want to remain, you know, friendly and I want to be a good co-parent and I want to, I want to have an appreciation for how this might be hitting you. And I want to see if I can, um, continue to be a support to you and you can continue to be a support to me. You know, it happens. It doesn't happen often. Well, I think this, this brings us back to the value of sadness <clears throat> is that it's perfectly understandable that we need all the variations of anger in order to shore up our ego, in order to have some agency, in order to have the courage mm -hmm. to um, repel ourselves out of something that's been so central. But I think it is in the sadness that we we can sit with that question of, I, uh, you know, I still feel for you. I, your suffering matters as well as my own. Mm. And yes, and and I I think some people have this. Um, this fantasy that we'll transition and be friends. And mm -hmm. maybe that's true. But what I have found um, to be most helpful is if couples can make a contract to be nonviolent mm. in the divorce process, that there is there can be a commitment to gentleness and nonviolence in mm -hmm. the process in the way that the couple speaks to each other in the way that they speak to the children, in the way that they um, navigate the uh, separation of property, that um, things can be done with enough gentleness that there is a humanity in it. Mm -hmm. And that I think yeah. that's the gift of sadness, because when we're feeling really sad about it. We generally don't want to club the other person. Right, right. So but there is a softening yeah. process mm -hmm. around that, which is which, which is not to say that it has to be that way or that it is for everyone, but um, it seems well, to me that that's helpful. Yes. I mean, I, I think one of the things that it happens in a marriage is there is the... Um, and we and we talked to, we talked about this before, but there's a making of a life together. Right. You've got one set of pans. You've got you know the family recipes all in one place. You've got you know the one set of Christmas decorations. You've got um, you know I, I I remember when when my husband and I were engaged uh we bought up we purchased our first home we weren't married yet we purchased the house and we went and we you know went to the closing and <laughs> he looked at me and he said well you know I mean you thought the big deal was when we got married but we're we're really connected now you know because we <laughs> both the names are both on that mortgage you know so I mean the degree to which um couples can their finance their financial lives are entangled um i mean it's really uh you, you know there's there's there so they're they're practical they're financial but but above all there's kind of emotional and even psycho spiritual ways that we are connected and so if mm -hmm. a, if a marriage is a making of a life together and if, you mm -hmm. know friends and i haven't even mentioned children it, it, yes. then the divorce is an unmaking of that life. And so every little, you know, every little item in the house, is it his or is it hers? You know, if it's a heterosexual mm -hmm. couple, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what do we do? What do we do about this? Who wants this? You know, which friends are going to go with this person versus that person? What are the, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a tremendous undoing of something. And when I think about the divorce process, unlike what leads up to it, the, the divorce process is a, a conscious unraveling. Mm -hmm. um, now, often there are many years of um, challenges or insults or betrayals or frustrations, disappointments that lead up to this tipping point where we no longer have faith in the idea of the union. And then we are surprised to find out the innumerable meticulous decisions 
with all kinds of competing values that we have to weigh inside of ourselves, within the legal situation, with our soon-to-be ex-spouse, and as you said, weighing the needs of the children. And it forces us also to consider how many ways our lives have become woven together Mm -hmm. in ways that we do not even understand until they are either rent or unraveled by decision of fate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the great cost, people are exhausted as they're moving through divorces. It takes Mm -hmm. an enormous amount of libido Mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, I think um, you, you said something like this a minute ago, but I think I, I just want to go back to it and lift it up. You know, I have people that come in kind of claiming this is the process that they want. And I've spent years sitting with someone over this decision. And sometimes people will say, oh, you know, it's taking me so long. You must be getting frustrated. I'm like, no, you take the time that you need to take. And what what I I think I've said this before in the podcast, but what I'll say to people is like, you're not going to get certainty. I mean, again, unless there's violence or drug use or gambling or, you know, something, something that makes it really, really just uh, black and white. But if you're not in that zone, if you're, if you're married to a perfectly reasonable person, (laughs) Um, you know, a, a basically decent human being, okay, but there are just these kind of irreconcilable differences, then, you know, you, you may never get certainty, but you can get clarity. And, uh, you know, I, I want to just make a little hat tip here. A few months ago, I sat in on, um, I was a thesis reader for a candidate from Zurich. And, uh, I'm not going to say her name now because she hasn't given me permission, but if she gives me permission, we'll put it in the show notes. She wrote her thesis on divorce, and it was a really lovely, lovely job. She did a great job um, looking at divorce essentially as a, an individuation process, which I, I, I love that idea. And I think someone, if she doesn't publish this, I hope maybe someone someday will write that book. But um, I asked her as part of her thesis of defense, I said, you know, how do you know when it's right to leave? And I I loved the answer that she gave. Because she she I'm paraphrasing, but she said something like when all of the urgency is gone. When all all of the urgency to leave has just disappeared. And you you've sort of sat through that and come to the other side, and it still looks like the right thing to do to leave. And I thought, yeah, mm-hmm. that feels about right. So, you know, we fall in love with another person, and all of a sudden we're like, okay, we've got to leave the marriage. You know, oh, that the marriage is the only thing wrong in my life. If I were just with this other person, everything would be great. No, well, that's probably not the right time to leave a marriage. I mean, you know, granted, the the exception being if there's urgency because there's violence or any of these other things. That's different. But that emotional urgency that we feel sometimes simply because we want to collapse the tension. It's that Mm -hmm. urgency that that I would say, uh, distrust that. You know, if it's sort of if it doesn't make a difference practically, if you leave now or six months from now, and you can just kind of feel this impulse to leave just so that it's over with and you don't have to think about it anymore. Maybe think about it some more Um, because it is a big deal. It is costly. It's costly to go through a divorce. It is tremendously costly financially. And I haven't looked at these numbers in a long time, but divorce is one of the kind of uh, life events that can really take a toll on your financial health. Um, And of course, if there are kids, you know, I mean, kids are, Kids are uh, resilient, and most will do okay, and we know that it affects kids. So it's a big decision, and sometimes it's the right one to make. I think all of that is very, very practical and, and real. So I find myself just wanting to shift a little bit uh, into talking about the as you had begun the psychological process that mm-hmm. we kind of go through. Yeah. So I think that, you know, in the beginning, of course, as you had said, Lisa, 
any number of parts of the psyche will come to our aid, which is generally our defenses. Because in that declaration that the divorce is real, it has been spoken. I mean, that's really kind of the the first yes. salvo, that there's lots of griping, oh, I can't stand you, or go sleep on the couch, or if you do that one more time, and that's actually all the, just the kind of griping. It's mm -hmm. it, There's the protest period. If you, one more time, you know, or Ralph crammed into the moon, Alice, you know, um, which, are, which are all of these venting uh, processes that we go through. And then there's the moment of, I want this to be done. Yeah. And the other person says, I agree. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we're plunged into a, a crisis time. Yeah. Which is, which, as you were saying, all of these, this raw stuff comes forward. Part of it, part of the raw stuff is that the marriage has acted as a kind of container. Yeah. I mean, there are all kinds of explicit and implicit rules mm -hmm. that, that exist around the marriage. And as the marital image dissolves, everything in the zoo, you know, starts to mm -hmm. move out, you know, into the town. Mm -hmm. So we find ourselves willing to be more rageful and say much more mm -hmm. hurtful things than we might have said two years earlier. Yep. Or suddenly someone just decides they're not coming home one night, leaving the other person frightened, even though divorce has been named. We're not accustomed to having the normal structures suddenly just break down. So it's frightening to be in that crisis um, process. We can also understand that that's normal. Mm -hmm. that there's been a lot of tension and frustration, and now that the marriage isn't containing that, things are going to erupt. Some of those things are going to be shadowy, and by that mm -hmm. I mean surprising and hard to approve of, but some of those things are going to be rather marvelous. I've seen people declare they're getting divorced, and then they've been unable to get themselves to apply for a new job. And then suddenly, mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. weeks after the divorce is declared, their CV is updated and they're out um, looking for a better job. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, they could not find the libido six months right. earlier when the marriage or the, the conscious or unconscious rules of the marriage were in place. Uh, all of a sudden, somebody is spending hours more a week with their friends, which is something they wanted to do during the marriage. But now that the rules of the marriage are gone, reigniting important social relationships, which are inherently positive anyway, suddenly seem permitted. Mm -hmm. But all of this new material begins to flood our psyches, flood the house, and flood our partners. So. That is a discovery process if we're paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. That we learn something about ourselves, lots of things about ourselves, and a lot of things about our spouse as we watch them suddenly give themselves permission mm -hmm. to do things that the rules of the marriage didn't seem to accommodate. And I don't mean simply and perhaps suddenly being more sexual. It's actually much more complicated than that. Yes. Yes. Well, one of the things I'm thinking as you're talking is, so one of the things that happens in the process of the dissolution of a marriage is that we take back our projections. So when we mm -hmm. fell in love, you know, you were the best thing ever. And I projected my, you know, parts of myself onto you, you know, mm -hmm. um, the the, uh, the the animus even perhaps the self we project onto mm -hmm. to a lover and uh, um, and over time you know we we take some of those projections back but boy as a marriage is dying we we really take those back the other thing that happens is that we take back those functions that we've delegated to the other person 
Mm-hmm. So this can look, um, I had a, I have a, fr- I have a friend and, um, her, so her parents, um, you know, actually both just recently passed away, but they, they, when they were married, she did everything for him to mm-hmm. the point that when they got divorced, he would buy those little containers of yogurt with like a fruit yogurt and didn't know that you had to stir it to bring up the fruit from the bottom. So, and you know, I mean, listen, any relationship you're in, there are things that you do that your partner doesn't do and vice versa. So I, you know, I, Mm -hmm. you know, even if you try to fight that, it's like, you know, well, um, she's the one who pays the bills and he knows where everything is or whatever it is, you know, even if you've got a kind of um, egalitarian marriage, you've delegated something. He's the one who changes the light bulbs and she's the one who gets the cars fixed or whatever it is. Right. And we do that emotionally. Yeah. So he's the one who worries about retirement. She's the one who takes care of the friends. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, she's the one who attunes to his moods, and he's the one who, um, uh, you know, is is kind of, you know, the strong shoulder to cry on when she gets overwhelmed. Whatever it is, you've made some unconscious or barely conscious deal with your partner where there's certain things that he does and there's certain other things that you do or whatever the, the sexes are we're talking about. So when you get divorced, you have to learn how to stir your own yogurt. And that's true for both the practical things, but it's also true for those emotional things. And and that's why divorce can be a potential for individuation. Because it can be stultifying to be in a relationship where you never have to stir your emotional yogurt. There's all kinds of things you don't know about yourself. Right. When you suddenly get that thrown back at you, it's like, whoa, it's like you're meeting yourself for the first time. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, it, it's very disorienting. It's very upsetting, but it is, you know, kind of renewing in a way, or it can be. Um, the the woman whose thesis I read, I wanted to share a great quote from her thesis. She said, we need to live our divorce as fully as we are able. And and I like that. It's the sense like, okay, as I'm doing this, I'm here for it. What what can I learn from all of this? Who am I on the other side of this? You know, I'm no longer the person who doesn't know how to stir my own yogurt. Now I'm a completely different person. Look at that. That's fascinating. So it, it there is an opportunity for it to be a growth experience. It does invite us to grow up. And it can be a kind of initiation. I, I think that's absolutely true. That on a practical sense i've had male friends who divorce and then all of a sudden half the furniture in the house is gone they're kind of sitting there on a stool and then they discover that of course they have apportioned the decorating of the house to their wives yeah and then once they relax through the shock and sadness they think they begin to discover i actually have some ideas about what i think is beautiful or how i want my Mm -hmm surroundings to reflect my psyche and what's important to me and then we'll discover that they actually have a lot of interesting choices that they'd like to make about their surroundings that they have Mm -hmm. assigned another thing that i think is so important is that men when they're young are very interested in whether or not they are attractive to their mates and they'll invest a fair amount of energy in it often Men will project beauty onto their spouse, that Mm -hmm. they're the attractive one. You know, I'm kind of the hard worker or maybe the the leader of the family or whatever fantasy it is. Mm -hmm. But the wife is the one who's carrying all of the beauty in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I see men in their 40s or 50s, about six months after the divorce, actually looking in the mirror and wanting to be more attractive. Yeah. That that they want to hold some of this aesthetic upgrade the wardrobe dynamic. yeah 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 like actually um i'd like to know a little bit of that beauty in myself or however i characterize that mm-hmm. uh, similarly i've seen uh, men take a, a much greater interest in children mm-hmm. uh 
not just their own children, but nieces and nephews, that they've assigned the care of children to their spouses and then discovered that it's deeply rewarding to care for a child, to care Mm -hmm. for the family pet, even to care for the garden, which again had been assigned outward. So it's an opportunity for a man to, as we were saying, discover his anima. Mm Mm-hmm. Discover that the inner feminine in him is alive and well. And now that it's not projected onto the wife or in a gay relationship onto the other partner, now it's in me. And often, because it's later in life, we're a little more capable of bringing Mm -hmm. forward some of those qualities than we would have been 20 years earlier. Yeah. So there's the real, the real possibility for sub renewal and, uh, and getting to know ourselves as a different person, because we, we do inevitably become somewhat defined, and I would say even constrained by even a very good relationship. It's just part of the nature of it. Absolutely. Um, so things get kind of thrown up in the air. I was thinking, I remember I once worked with a woman who uh, had just gone through a divorce, and she went to the grocery store shortly after she moved out, and she was shopping, and uh, it, she it came, you know, she was in the cookie aisle, let's say, I'm kind of making this up, and um, she started to buy the cookies that her husband and children liked, and stopped herself short and thought, I can buy the cookies I like, and then she thought, what kind of cookies do I like? She had, you know, she'd been married with kids for a couple of decades and she had, Mm -hmm. she had not even queried what kind of cookies would I like for almost two decades. And there she was in the cookie aisle thinking, wow, I can buy whatever cookies I want. So Mm -hmm. there's, there is a, there can be a real sense of renewal. Absolutely. One of the uh, years ago, I, um, made this decision that for my female friends, uh, when they had announced, or if they announced they were getting a divorce, that I would put together a toolbox for them. Because <laughs> very commonly, that was one of the things that they had assigned to their husband. And all of a sudden, the screwdrivers have disappeared and the power drills. And and how empowering and strange it was for them for me to show up with a, a gift of a toolbox. And then how enlivening it was they'd yeah. like call me up they're like i yeah. changed the electrical outlet yeah you're right yeah, yeah. you know and i was like yeah, yeah you go yeah. you know yeah. so all of these i know that sounds extremely traditional but it's also not yeah no, but it's it, there's i mean let's face it that that happens i'll buy my male friends the joy of cooking yeah yeah like <laughs> you know and at first they're like what man i'm not gonna have a cook again but i'm like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then you know, all of a sudden I, They'll call me I up have, and say, I baked a souffle. It was amazing. You know? I, I have a friend who got divorced a few years ago, and he got so into cooking. He got really into, it was either vegetarian or vegan cooking, to mm-hmm. the point where I think he even started a food vlog, you know, uh, and he'd never cooked before, but he was having so much fun uh, learning all of these things. And and so, I mean, we're, gosh, we're making divorce sound really great right now. <laughs> but there is this upside to it. Absolutely. Particularly if it's been a lengthy marriage where so much has been apportioned yes. to one partner and then the other. And we don't even realize, you know, somebody gets divorced and they're like, I don't think I've changed the toilet paper in I my know. bathroom in 20 <laughs> years. Right. Who, who's been doing that? And, <laughs> you know, it's so, like, Okay. So yeah. uh, it's a lot of list making that happens you mm-hmm. know, after the divorce. But So the movement, um, as we go through crisis and tumult, one of the things that we can try to do is take back into ourselves things that we have assigned to our partners, our exes, and develop some conscious relationship to it to understand that all of the cages are open and all of our beasts are now roaming around the town, okay, so it is, that we are going to begin to have to create some structure. And actually, the legal divorce process is often the beginning of the structuring process. Mm -hmm. Because we need the ego 
to establish the new rules. You know, where are the kids going to be on what days? What's the budget? What money is coming and going from where? where what are the living arrangements? Um, th- those are not necessarily things that would have been foremost on our minds, perhaps if we'd been more educated about it, but all of a sudden we're building the new foundation mm-hmm. through that. One of the important transitions also is that often to leave a marriage, we have to blame the other person mightily yes. and ridiculously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's all of this kind of resent, resentment and demonization of the others. Even yes. the person, let's say, who's had the affair, which has caused the the marriage perhaps, or the final blow to the marriage, often there's many, many difficulties mm-hmm. leading up to something like that. They will still... Um, demonize and devalue the other spouse who didn't have the affair, Mm -hmm. and we devalue something to diminish the pain of losing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we get fired from a job. Oh, I never liked that job at all. You know, uh, my boss was a big jerk. Well, that's fine. I mean, because we need to survive these transitions. So in the beginning, there's all of this demonization of the other, hopefully, in about two to three years, the person can begin to tolerate understanding that the dissolution of the marriage or the marital problems were Mm co-created. And many of the incompatibilities are actually neither person's fault. Right. That we don't know what we don't know, and there are vast terrains of our psyches that are hidden from us, let alone from our spouses that emerge 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. Who knew mm-hmm. that um, I needed to become a farmer and live in rural North Carolina, and you needed to go and move to Manhattan and, you know, mm-hmm. go on to Wall Street and become, you know, an incredible Wall Street shark investing into all kinds of things. Um, we didn't know that. We didn't mm-hmm. know that the self would demand those things. So what What are we going to do? It is, can the amalgam survive? And I find for myself, and I'm as vulnerable as anyone to get into a snit about one thing or another, but the faster that I can can lean into the feeling that there are greater forces at work, both with the bringing together of people Mm -hmm. as well as the separation of people, that the self has a hand in the events of our lives, Mm -hmm. even when they're deeply painful, all in service to growth, truly. Mm -hmm. Even Mm -hmm. infidelity, and this is something I know you've... uh, written about and are knowledgeable about in your practice, Lisa, is that infidelity, if it's understood in the right way, can be seen as uh, a sometimes even desperate attempt to to individuate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Inelegant, perhaps, or even clumsy. But all things have a telos in them, which is part of our determination as Jungians. And telos means that there is a secret purpose in all mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. that the universe has a kind of intelligence, or at very least our psyches do, so that even our even our what seem to be mistakes, our clumsy, unskilled behaviors that may lead to tumult in our lives, that there is a greater force that is trying to move us mm-hmm. in a direction. And sometimes that causes great suffering. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree with you about infidelity, but let me let me just uh, lean in there for a second. You know, I I have seen, as I alluded to earlier, a couple of what I would call really exceptionally good divorces, where people mm-hmm. remained on good terms, um, were able to like be at family events. You know, were able to um, share a second home compatibly. Uh, 
um, n- you know, nursed each other when they got ill, you know, in spite of the fact that maybe they were both in other relationships or whatever, but, and, and I, and, and then, or, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, real, really that ideal thing of we're going to put the kid first and we're not going to put the kid in the middle and we're going, the number one thing is what's right for this kid. And we can co-parent like that and kind of ha- continue to have respect for each other, even while we're doing this difficult thing of disentangling. And, you know, it's, it's incredibly moving to see these kinds of situations and, and, and there's a real value to it. I mean, on the one hand, it's so much better for kids. Um, but even if the kids are adults or there are no kids, to be able to, it, you know, to keep intact the, you know, yeah, I didn't know what I didn't know when I married you when I was 24. But, you know, I didn't make such a terrible decision either. You're basically a good guy. And I needed to go on my way. But uh, I can honor what we had together. I can honor the life we built. And, I you know, I can continue to have warm feelings about you. There's something really, really great about that. What I will say about both of those situations that I'm thinking of is there was a really good process. There was a really good process, whether it was a, a an individual therapy process, um, you know, or, or kind of deep couples therapy. And, and so what we're talking about is by the time the decision came, a lot had been made conscious. And I, I, I do have a lot of empathy, actually, for people who just go have an affair. Because the thing is, I think when you're in tumult, and you know that a relationship needs to end, but you maybe can't, you can't find the courage to do it. Having an affair, it, it's like, um, you know, it's a little bit like that image of you're trying to climb over a, t- a tall wall, and you take your bag and you throw it over the wall. Once you've thrown your bag over the wall, you've got to figure out how to climb the wall. And uh, that is, that is, I think, what an affair winds up being for a lot of people is it's like the way out of the relationship because you've, the, the other metaphor is, you know, you've burned your ships in the harbor, you can't go back anymore. But, but it's, but it's not a way, it, 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 it isn't, there, there wasn't a lot of consciousness there. So that, that would not, although I have empathy for people who do that, it's not the best way. And if you can, mm-hmm. if you can remain in the conflict and sit with the conflict and not collapse the, the tension and um, really get curious about what's going on and maybe do some deep work, maybe do some couples therapy, um, see what's there, what's not there. To come around to that at the end, uh, you know, that I think might be a psychologically richer experience if you can do it. And of course, I'll just say it one more time, you know, this, this is not the case if there's violence in the relationship or anything else like that. It, those, that admonition does not apply. But, but otherwise, there might be some real value into trying to just stay in the conflict and, until, there's, until there's real clarity. Uh, and I concur. I'm not suggesting people have affairs um, right. as a way of of actualizing, but often, maybe in hindsight, people will return to revisit. Why did I do that? What was that yeah. about? Oh, absolutely. And and there is a telos in it. I like the way Buddhists will often um, look at their choices and behaviors and the choices of behaviors of others. And rather than say whether it was right or wrong, they'll say that something was less skilled or more skilled. Mm -hmm. That perhaps having that affair or getting caught up in an affair, which is often more likely what it is, getting Mm -hmm. swept into an affair was an unskilled attempt to individuate. Yes. An unskilled attempt to transition um, out of a relationship that was very painful and or given yeah. the situation now, I would be more skilled about that. People also have affairs, they're called compensatory affairs, that in order to stay in the marriage, mm-hmm. they will find uh, a side partner and attain an aspect of something that the marriage is not providing, mm-hmm. which is enough for them to stay stable in the situation and not have to 
mm-hmm. blow things up. Again, I'm not talking about that as a strategy, but it is a thing that happens. It's and then there are transitional that. affairs, which, as you were saying, that somebody wants a, a kind of safe, erotic harbor mm-hmm. to to rest into as mm-hmm. they withdraw from one relationship. So the fear of abandonment often and the struggle to self-soothe mm-hmm. um, can compel somebody temporarily into another person's arms so that they can tolerate the strain of transitioning out of a marriage. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't want to say whether that's right or wrong. There are reasons why we do these things. And again, looking back, we might say, well, I, I had if I was the person I am now, I would have done something different, more skilled. Mm-hmm. But again, there is an, an intelligence in these things based mm-hmm. on what is possible for us at a given moment. Sure. You know, uh, uh, one, of th- one of the positive things I think we can bring to the discussion is that, uh, you know, it's uh, almost 2024, probably will be 2024 by the time people are hearing this. And uh, there, there are options, you know, so uh, a few years ago, it was a, it was a little bit, um, uh, I think, you know, made fun of, but the, you know, this term conscious uncoupling came on the scene, mm-hmm. you know, but, but it, it raises this idea that this could be kind of negotiated without rancor. And it just, it might be just, you know, something that's conscious that we both make a decision to go different ways uh, you know, there's also, I've heard um, people describe something that, that's called a parenting marriage, where you mm-hmm. um, effectively decide to um, dissolve the romantic kind of intimate portion of the connection, but you you want to prioritize co-parenting. And so it's it's a little different than just staying in the marriage for the kids, because you're not exactly doing that. You're You're sort of liberating yourself emotionally. And I suppose that might mean having another partner or, or not, but, but you're, you're, you're making it explicit that what we're going to do now is focus on raising the kids and we're, we're going to kind of declare that the marriage is over, but this is our joint project now. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the, there may be other ways where people can kind of get creative uh, about how to solve some of these problems, and and thank goodness there there are there are options. There are absolutely, as you say. I, I've only had one friend uh, and his wife who um, tra- tra- truly transitioned out of their marriage mm-hmm. um, thoughtfully and nonviolently. Now there were no children involved. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a, a just a substantial care for each other, and a willing to sacrifice to eat what the other person felt they needed in order to be safe and step away, and it was remarkable. I think mm-hmm. that they imagined that they would retain a friendship, which they did not. But it wasn't that they uh, walked away raging. Mm-hmm. It seemed that. Even though the process was thoughtful and gentle, continuing to meet with each other, it was as if they kept pulling the scab off of a wound. Yeah. And each time they came back to themselves, they they were just bleeding again. Mm -hmm. And so they needed to stay away a good long time just to allow the psychic skin to heal. And then I think after that, they had just became interested in other people. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to speak a little bit about this post-divorce process, um, and I particularly want to talk about it to the men in our audience, because two-thirds of divorces, I think that's the statistic, are initiated by women. Yes. Um, Most men, statistically, will stay in a marriage that they think is bad for them, perhaps because they've found ways to be less sensitive or to compensate for things. And women generally report a greater satisfaction a couple of years after the divorce, have a Mm -hmm. tendency to look back and think, whoa, I made the right choice, my life is better. Men have a tendency 
to fall into depression and social isolation mm -hmm. for much longer periods and sometimes for decades after a divorce. So men often do not feel fully restored until they have initiated the next successful intimate relationship. Mm. I want to say that um, there's nothing wrong with mm. that, that we all need what we need, and there's no prescription. Yeah. So a lot of men feel ashamed um, during and after a divorce. They have a sense that they failed to to keep their woman or their spouse happy, to provide enough, whether that's emotionally or financially, that in some way they are inadequate, mm -hmm. even though they might mm -hmm. rage during the process. But when they are left alone, there is a sense of deep sorrow yeah. Yeah. and defeat, and shame which can capture even. a man for, for years. Yeah. This leaves men much more vulnerable to alcoholism and suicide, uh, homelessness even later in mm. life. So to me, it is the loss of the anima object that a man may divorce or be divorced more frequently is left by his wife. And when she leaves, she takes his anima with him. Mm -hmm. And he will too often pine of her. And the divorced men in my practice find themselves dreaming about their ex-wives um, very very, very frequently. Hmm. Hmm. So it is difficult for the anima to land on another person or to reconfigure itself. Jung notices as well that most men um, will settle into a single anima image, while women have um, often a multitude of animus hmm. images. Hmm. That There's more flexibility, more creativity in how the animas can look inside the feminine psyche. So, one, I want to reach out to those men who yeah. are in despair post-divorce and say that what you are experiencing is understandable and well understood. Mm. And that mm. other men will understand you if you choose to reach out. Even, even our neighbors, who we might not have been terribly close to, the community of men around you are generally very responsive mm -hmm. if you reach out in your pain for yeah. some kind of support, which could be as simple as, let's, let's watch the game on the TV. Um, yeah, thank you for raising that, Joseph. I think that's really important, and and uh, I'm I'm so glad you brought it up. And... I was thinking, you know, here we were talking about, you know, food vlogs and, you know, all these other wonderful things. I thought, oh, are we, are we, um, or, or describing these divorces that were very harmonious, let's say. It, it, it I want to make sure that we don't um, um, kind of make glide over, right? Yeah. Uh, the 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 deep pain and, and, and also that, you know, we're talking about our tenderest, most vulnerable aspects of ourselves, our need for intimacy, our dependency needs, these are deep, 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 deep places. And when that becomes violated, you know, in effect, we are um, very young. You know, we, we uh, whether or not we know it, we're in a kind of childhood place, a young child place. We could feel profoundly rejected, profoundly hurt, and also like profoundly furious. You know, so, so the, again, I mean, we did raise this before, but to sort of go back to it, just the hatred that can be engendered by this process as we feel so betrayed by someone with whom we entrusted our very soul. So that is um, undoubtedly a piece of it for many people. So let's finish by just throwing out a couple of self-care ideas for men and women, because I think mm -hmm. there are different things. But I would like to speak to the men, um, is that do reach out 
to the community of fellows that are around you, even if you haven't before. And generally, men your own age have a tendency to be more aligned. If you've been divorced for a little while and you find that you have not found a way to thrive yet, I'm going to say something which will seem counterintuitive to you. Go and get body work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That investing, even if you've got to really scrimp the money from some other place, and give yourself a massage twice a month, maybe once a week, yep. at a reputable place, a therapeutic massage. And by the way, it doesn't matter if this comes with a male massage therapist or a female, but for another human being to yep. consciously and attentively make contact with your body with the intent to calm, soothe, to help you let go and feel safe again. And for many men, it's the gate of the body that allows them to come back into themselves. And there are many other kinds of body work. So you may doubt my saying that as, as you are alone and perhaps having dinner alone tonight mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. But to take a bold step and to do something as simple as just go in a clinical setting and have your body well tended to. Mm -hmm. There's a good amount of research, by the way, uh, well done research to suggest that your mood will improve, your sense of isolation will reduce the sense of trauma and distress mm -hmm. around the loss will reduce, and you will begin to have a sense of being comfortable in the world once more. And out of that, many other choices can come forth. That's great advice. And I actually have a, a friend who's divorced, and she has gotten a weekly massage forever. Even during the pandemic, she kept it up. Mm -hmm. So, and I think you're, I think you're right. Sort of tending to the body is really great. Um, I do want to offer a book suggestion. There's a book mm -hmm. by Jungian analyst Guggen, Guggen Buell Craig called Marriage Dead or Alive, which is a really mm -hmm. interesting look at marriage and divorce. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we will, um, make that available in the show notes. Um, and then I want to just offer something about um, dating again, because sometimes men and women feel like they've got to they've got to get back out there, and before the ink is dry on the divorce decree, they they're they're on the dating apps, and they're. This is not necessarily a problem, but what what I'm aware of is that's that that can be a depressing, difficult process. You know, if you're really in the market for somebody and you're going on date after date after date and they're all disappointing and you just think, you know, it, it might be important to give yourself uh, just a little break from that and maybe take some time to rediscover who you are, to have some of these broadening experiences. One of the things I like about your suggestion about massage too, Joseph, is it's in that category of maybe something we've never done before especially for yeah. men. And, um, and, and there's something enlivening about doing something you've never done. So, it, you know, if you're divorced, it comes, there's a, there are downsides and there are upsides. And the upsides is one of the upsides is you have more freedom and maybe take advantage of that freedom to do something that you've never done before. I mean, it might be like, Oh, I don't know. Take a hip hop class. You know, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be big, although it could be, maybe you've never traveled to Europe by yourself before and you decide you want to do that, but give yourself some time to experience yourself and be in relationship with yourself before exhaust, getting into what can be an exhausting and bruising process of dating. From the other side, fellas, I think <laughs> there can be merit putting yourself out on some dating apps, even if you don't get any dates. Yeah, yeah. But just to get a sense of what is the dating market like? Sure. How do I rank as I kind of put myself out there? Mm -hmm. By the way, if you don't know how to do this, watch a couple of YouTube videos so you actually present yourself in a way that's to your advantage, both <laughs> in terms of information and photographs, by the way. It might 
give you good cause for hope to see that there are people out there that are at least winking at you. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean you have to invite everybody That's on right. a date. It doesn't yep. mean you've got to run off with them. But it would be nice to know that, you know, you've got a little bit of something, a little bit of shine is still Life in continues. There. Life continues. And you've yeah. got something to offer. And sometimes just being on the dating app for a month or two, and even if you close it down, you're like, you know, when I'm ready, there's people out there. Yep. And there's people yep. out there that are interested. And that's that's not a bad thing to know. I would completely concur. (laughs) And so now we're going to shift over and do what we always do, which is to talk about a dream. Today's dream is a 33-year-old woman who works as a software engineer And the dream is called Missing Baby. Here's the dream. I dreamt I lived in a house with many other people and children, including my mother. I gave birth to a baby that already had crooked, yellow, pointy teeth, lots of hair, and could crawl. I knew my ex-boyfriend would be mad at me for having him, but I don't think he was the father. I set the baby down and turned away for a few seconds, and then he was gone. I didn't want anyone to know I had lost him. And while I was looking everywhere in the house, my mom came and told me the police were there to search the house because we had been reported by a neighbor as hoarders. I knew she had illegal drugs in the house, so I told her to let me hide them for her. The police didn't find anything. After they left, someone from the house came and told me that they found my baby outside by the pool where he could have drowned. I had only been looking inside the house, and I was ashamed I didn't think to look there, but grateful to have him back. And she notes that she was recently broken up with and that she has started a new job that she finds unfulfilling. The main feelings in the dream were shame at not caring for the baby and a fear of the police. And finally, she notes that the house was like the one I lived in with my mom as a teenager, and my mom is very childlike. So this is kind of a a pretty heartbreaking dream. Um, there's a lot of pain in it. Let Let's start with that. Can you say more about the pain that it evokes for you? Uh, well, I mean, I I think any time that there's kind of an image of a lost baby in a dream, or an injured baby, or an injured or lost animal. It's often um, an image of how we have been untended to and have been unable to tend to ourselves. So, uh, yeah, the first thing that comes up for me is is just sort of an intuition about, um, well, I mean, I suppose it's an informed intuition. Uh, we know her mother was childlike, and there's some imagery in the dream that points to what that may have been like, that this person probably had a pretty chaotic upbringing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just just building on that for a second, that uh, you know, if we have our primary caregiver, which is often the mother, if the mother is struggling to function, she can often perceive her babies as monstrous, in as much as the babies have such fierce primal needs, and to the mother who is childlike or under functioning, the child's needs can seem monstrous. So one of the things that I go to is the baby she is given birth to is somewhat monstrous, hairy with pointy yellow mm-hmm. teeth. It's, it comes out of the womb and is crawling wildly all over the place. And, and there's a way in which if we are perceived as monstrous in some way, then that's an image that we can uh, adopt and that can stay mm-hmm. in us. Yeah. So... She lives in a house with many other people and children, including her mother. So just thinking about or fantasizing what part of the psyche the action is taking in. So we have house, we have mom, but it also seems like it's communal in some way, that there's many people, Mm -hmm. not necessarily siblings, and many children. 
So it's this interesting juxtaposition of the intimate and the collective are, are somehow involved in this dream. So again, leading yeah. into your intuition about what's what's going on in the childhood home and the fact that it doesn't seem contained, yes. which of course is one of the themes in the dream that you know your baby mm -hmm. disappears, it's crawling outside and and you're not even sure what's going on. So mm -hmm. there is something about the, the lack of maternal arms that would normally be surrounding the home and tending. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, um, <laughs> I think I have a lot to say here. Go so for it. I'm going to put a, yeah, a, yeah, big, yeah. a big, pretty big it. piece out. So, Here's a theme that I hear in the dream that, you know, she doesn't want anyone to know that she lost the baby. And then, you know, it's been, they've been trying to hide it from the neighbors at their hoarders, but it's been reported. And then she's trying to help her mother hide the illegal drugs. So there's a sense of like shame and the need to hide something. And I find that that is such an inevitable constellation in people who have had parents who have substance abuse issues. So whether or not your parents are drug users or alcoholics, the one thing I hear again and again and again and again and again is shame. So there's so there's such deep, deep shame when we grow up in a house where we kind of know that uh, our situation's not the norm and we have to hide it and their secrets. So I, I really hear that as a, a sort of, you know, installed feature in this person's psyche that there's probably, I mean, when we feel that sort of not uh, situational shame, but almost it becomes part of your character structure where you feel ashamed kind of all the time. That's what I'm imagining about this person because it, she operates according to shame, like I don't want anyone to to know. Let the, it's like it's normal to hide. It's normal to hide things. I can't let anyone know about the baby. I've got to help my mom hide the drugs, and um, so I'm I'm guessing that in fact her mother did use substances. Her mother did use maybe drugs, and and I would also wonder whether or not there's a way that the dreamer has her own addiction issues. It may it may not be drugs. It may be. Um, it may just almost be a kind of addicted way of going through the world. And the reason that I say that is because um, she's so invested in the mother's behavior. So, um, you know, what happens essentially is she puts the baby down for a second and then he's gone and she's looking for him. And then the mom comes and interrupts the search and says, oh, no, the police are here, you know, because we're hoarders. And the dream ego totally takes that on. And instead of, uh, you know, um, allowing the police to do their work, and I'll say more about that in a minute, the dream ego is going to collude with the mother complex and make sure that no, one's, no one finds out about the drug. So it may be that there's some, you know, drug, and I'm putting that in air quotes, in the dreamer's life. And, and that could just be a tendency to go unconscious to things. It doesn't have to li literally be substance abuse, but it might be, um, where she's, she's very much aligned with this inner childlike mother who is hiding illegal drugs. And the cost of that is the baby almost drowns because she gets distracted from her job of looking for the baby um uh by by helping the mother no i want to i said i was going to come back to the police so let me do that if we look at the police as an image of um what what sometimes union analysts call the dominant like what is the dominant thing about police um we do this all the time on the podcast we call it explanation so police are there to enforce laws. So if you if you move out of the realm of personal association, and this dreamer might have personal associations to the police, and those would be interesting. But we don't have those. So let's work with explanation, which is also usually quite relevant. The police would be that part of the psyche that comes in and says, no, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be X, Y, or Z, whatever, whatever the dreamer's doing that is kind of like hiding illegal drugs or using illegal drugs or being a hoarder. The police are there to say, don't do it. 
But the dream ego is not yet ready to align with the police part of the psyche and is aligning rather with the mother part of the psyche. And, um, and, and that's where she's not taking good care of herself, right? That's the image of the baby by the pool is there is this new little baby and she's not adequately caring for him. The good news is that she finds the baby and she is grateful to have him back. And there's someone from the house that found the baby. So there is an inner part of her that is tracking her psychological baby. All right, that was a big piece. So I'll shut up, never now. Well, it's, it's wonderful. So with that frame, mm-hmm. what do you imagine the medicine is for the dreamer given this confrontation is being offered? And dreams, of course, Mm -hmm. can be highly confrontive. Right, right. Well, I mean, first of all, like I said, you know, the good news is there's someone who's tracking the baby. And and that part, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of in essence wins in the end. And there is a there is a very clear, positive resolution in this dream. And and in and that she gets the baby back and she's glad to have the baby back. And you know, it's like that's the part of the psyche she needs to align with is the baby part of the psyche, not the mother part of the psyche. So I, I, I would I would imagine that the dream is tracking inner movement and, uh, you know, that a subsequent dream might show that um, she's further along in being able to uh, kind of tolerate looking at the consequences of not tending to herself adequately. Mm -hmm. So I think that that reorientation towards what the priorities should be or could be is medicinal. I was also wondering if Mm -hmm. the medicine is just right there at the end when she says that she's grateful to have him back, that that's the first uh, appearance of gratitude. Yes, Um, yes. And for many of us that have, I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe it's uh, addiction, maybe it's childhood trauma, strangely enough, gratitude is often broken in people that have suffered greatly. And it is often mm. a sign that something is getting better. So, for yeah. instance, um, there is a certain quality in the dream of narcissism. And, and again, I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions. I don't mean to offend the person who submitted the dream, but um, it's the narcissistic refocusing that allows the dreamer to put her baby down. She's like, oh, where's the baby? Well, we've got other priorities going on here. Um, right. Where the relationship is, is not primary. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that when somebody who's suffering with a narcissistic wound or a narcissistic complex is able to feel gratitude, because that is always yeah. missing with a narcissistic complex, something is softening, that something is opening up. Mm-hmm. I find in the dream, as you were talking about, I'm sorry, what were we going to say? No, no, it's like, you go uh, ahead. I'll come back. I was thinking about the the sequencing. So she can't find the baby, and then the police come, and they are searching. So mm, she thinks great. they're searching for that's drugs, great. but we don't know. But that mm-hmm. something that the ego can't identify with, which is her own prioritization of the search, arrives... And Mm -hmm. I don't know that she says whether or not the police are male and female, but I think we often associate that kind of civil militia with the masculine energy. So she Mm -hmm. really does need her animus energy to show up and mobilize her and also redirect her. You know, that that Mm -hmm. the search is the important thing, whatever else is going on, like hiding is not, is that's not what the priority is here because you have a missing baby. So mm-hmm. I like that the police come and they, they're they yeah. declaring. Now, there is the illegal or illicit 
drugs that are being hidden. She's just had a baby. She doesn't know who the father is. And the baby is um, strangely precocious. So there's also some combination between the illegal or illicit drugs and the uh, illicit quote-unquote baby that she doesn't know how it arrived. And both of them, because of the atmosphere of shame, are hard for her to relate to and hard for her to want to display, to want to be associated mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling, is she going to get in trouble for just showing up magically with a baby that she doesn't even know how she gave birth to in the same way that she's uh, ashamed for people to find illicit drugs in the mm -hmm. house. <clears throat> the dreamer is a mother. Her own biological mother are in the dream. And there's this sense of something that's illicit or needing to be hidden. So the atmosphere of shame in the dream is distributed all over the place, and that mm -hmm. interferes with the feeling of natural priority, which of course would be the child, mm -hmm. uh, given how right. vulnerable children are. The other thing I go to in terms of building on your thesis of having been raised in a home that's disrupted, mm -hmm. um, is that children don't experience themselves as being prioritized. Right. And they are yes. left to kind of feral self-survival. Mm -hmm. And so that pattern is intergenerationally communicated. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, um, it's funny, I just made a note, you know, her mother didn't prioritize her. And that that brings me to the word um, parentified, which is this great, you know, some therapy speak, it's just so great. And parentified is a great therapy speak word, right? It means that we were a child who was made to behave as a parent. And I suspect that that happened here, both because she says in her associations that her mother was childlike, but also that's exactly what happens in the dream, right? She should be taking care of herself, right? Her baby. And instead, she feels the need to hide her mother's drugs. And, and as you were saying, Joseph, I mean, it's this really key thing because she gets pulled off of her care for herself to uh, kind of go over to the mother, which probably happened all throughout childhood and probably is continuing to happen now in real life. And this can be both an inner and an outer dynamic. So it could be that in real life, she is focusing too much on her mom, but even as an inner dynamic, like that, that, that sick part of us that, you know, the mother complex in, in this case, I think is not a particularly well part of this person that that's the part that she tends to prioritize rather than focusing on the baby. And um, so I, I, I do think, though, that um, that turning away from the baby, to me, it's very, very poignant because it's not, it's not that she's doing it because she's a terrible person. It's because she's doing it because she never had that experience of being mothered. And so it's very, very difficult to mother herself. So for me, it's, it's very poignant, and I feel a lot of empathy for the dreamer. And then I just want to say that the dream has this lovely mythological element of the kind of progressed child, the magical baby. It is a strange ma magical baby because it's it's a little it's a little um, creepy or something with its, it's a pointy yellow teeth. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. a changeling, but like other magical babies, it it can do things very very quickly. There's a there's a German fairy tale called the Black Princess. And uh, the king and the queen don't have any children. And essentially, to tell it very, very quickly, the um, the queen winds up praying to the devil for a child, and she is uh, what what uh, coal black daughter is born to her, and she grows as much in an hour as normal children grow in eighteen years, and they have this big party, and she says, "Oh, unhappy mother, oh, unhappy father, you know, now I'm going to, f you know." Sets up the whole rest of the tale, which is a whole other story. But the the point is that, um, you know, it's a little bit like this. There's something kind of dark and unholy that that arises, but it is new life. And spoiler alert, there's a wonderful positive transformation at the end of the story. So this baby may be a little unusual, but it is 
the 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 archetype of the divine child. It is new life, and it may need to be tended to in a particular way in order to be transformed into uh, the kind of handsome prince that these things inevitably turn into. And I just finally want to say, um, you know, picking up on something you had said, Joseph, you know, dreams can be really confrontational. They always come in service to health, health and healing and wholeness. So this, this is a little bit of a, you know, this is one of those dreams that might land pretty hard, but, I, but I think it's, it's here to, to show the dreamer away. And I think there's a lot of hope in it. Absolutely. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.